Aussie Autos official asks, is there a good book to set a baseline knowledge of IPM? Well, yeah, actually, there's a lot of th places where you can get some of that information. I often say that if you live in a place where you have access to an agricultural extension agent, definitely talk to them. Their whole job, you know, this is oversimplification, but basically their whole reason for being there in that position, that capacity, is to answer people's questions. In some cases, evaluate certain organisms, and they're going to be aware of the things in your locality Oftentimes, you're going to have more up-to-date information than other people might have in different places. But as far as books are concerned, I'll be honest, typically I make use of empirical research so much that I usually don't use book references. However, I do have, um, this is not an IPM book per se, but uh, this book, I'm a big fan of this book, this is, um, Garden Insects of North America, so for my friends who are not in North America, you know, you might have things that are relevant. This is a great book. Lots of great pictures. Yeah, that's not a, that's not a great shot, to be honest. But, uh, yeah, look at that. So this is a really great book. This is by the um, venerable entomologist Whitney Crenshaw, but also David Sheltar as well. And uh, they've titled this The Ultimate Guide to Backyard Bugs. So. Now this is the second edition that I have. I like it. I'll be honest, I don't use it a ton lately because I don't, I kind of downloaded that information. But it's a really great reference for pictures and it's not necessarily about IPM specifically, it's mostly about identification. But books like that are really helpful for that kind of a thing. I also make heavy use of the American Phytopathology Association's website, so APS. Go to that website, there are references for different pests and particularly usually you know pathogens and things like that, right? I'm actually looking to produce such a book for other people. Not, uh, I don't mention other books because I'm trying to compete with those people, I just genuinely don't use a lot of IPM reference books currently. If you're interested, that is something that I'm working on this year and hopefully will publish perhaps by the end of next year. The very next comment by uh, Five Skins Left is, Sink, do you have a book or any plans on writing one? Yes, I do. I just said so. so sorry, that was a very serendipitous uh, uh, thing. Dab Originals asks, what's a good plan for budworms? So budworm mods, um, there's a few different ones out there. It dep definitely depends on whether you're growing in a field where you're totally exposed to the environment or where you're growing in an indoor situation. You're probably not asking about budworms if you're growing indoor because you probably aren't dealing with them very much. So usually people don't deal with budworm moths because the very nature of having like, you know, a structure that's, you know, kind of impenetrable with also a door that's really flush and that sort of a thing. A good plan for budworms that I have in my presentation, uh, which is actually, uh, reference it's actually from Whitney Crenshaw this is actually from a research report that he published with others so you should definitely check that out it basically works like this you should first of all become familiar with pheromone traps so pheromone traps basically are little nets with a chemical compound in them that you buy separately usually and you apply it and you reapply them to the net uh, as you use this more often uh, basically, you want to apply it at the beginning or right before the beginning of the budworm moth season for your location. A lot of times this is going to be sometime in the spring, but it might be a little bit later in the spring depending on where you are. If you don't know when it, where it is or when it is, you can again talk to an agricultural extension agent who will probably know, or just put it in the beginning of spring. And then you'll find out for yourself because every year is different anyways. Every season is a little bit different. So you use a pheromone trap. We'll attract the males, not the females that lay eggs, right? Because they're also the ones that are going to be looking for the female pheromone, right? So they, attra they are attracted to it. They get caught in the net. You check the net at a regular interval. And then you check to see if the population, you know, if you're getting one or two every day, and then, or every week or whatever, and then suddenly you get 20 or 40, then you know that the population has increased in your local area, which means at that point you should start to apply preventative measures. So things like the microbial pathogens I mentioned, 
Uh, really popular are things like, well, there's a, there's a virus that people like to use actually, which is the Helicoverpa nucleopolyhedrovirus. Uh, that's very effective, but it's also very costly to sort of buy and apply, unfortunately. It's sort of the thing that I think mostly commercial people are using. There's a few microbes in the presentation that you should take a look at. Those are going to get into the gut. Basically, they produce cry proteins and other proteins as well. And those proteins, um, they interact with the intestinal lining of the caterpillar and then basically give it sepsis and it dies. Important to note, and it is a bacillus pro uh, product now that I think of it, there's several. Izawi and Kerstaki are two strains of two um, uh, species that are um, by Whitney Crenshaw recommended. And I also recommend them too. I find great efficacy with them. But it's important to note that you have to apply early and oftentimes at regular intervals, which again, the costs add up for that, your labor cost for yourself, if you're just applying by yourself, but also the product. And also, uh, it's most effective against young larvae. It's less effective against older caterpillars. And the thing about budworms is that typically they are laid as eggs on the bud, on the flower, the inflorescence, and then they hatch, and then they eat a little bit of leaf, and then they go right into the bud. So how are you going to make contact with it? You're not. You're not going to make contact with it if you don't apply it early enough. And uh, they rarely come out of the bud and then come, come back in. So if you do suspect that you have budworms, you know, the good plan is to apply them, is to apply the pheromone trap, hit them early with the microbes, whatever you want to use. Uh, that's going to be effective, right? And then um, follow up with extensive crop scouting where you are looking at your plants and you're checking and looking for symptoms of bud rot, symptoms of damage, and that you're cutting them out because here's the other really unfortunate thing about budworms because they're a catch-22 pest. Let's say you kill them. Let's say you get the caterpillar and you kill it. Well, um, it's still a dead cadaver that's rotting inside your inflorescence. And if you get it when it's really small, maybe it's not a huge deal. If you get it when it's bigger, well, you know, you might still lose some of your product. And I'm not trying to be flippant or glib when I'm saying this. Uh, it's a very significant problem for people, but it's also something that I see people sort of not uh, talk about. And I'm surprised that they don't mention this because I've experienced this a lot with other people. So other peers of mine, other people who are trying to help folks with plant health, um, I just think that's an important reality about budworms that I feel like people who sell these products or an otherwise sort of like recommend these products and these treatments, they're not really giving people the full picture essentially. So that's just a really important thing to consider. I know I might have belabored the point a bit, so that's the thing. Detection, uh, apply the products, and then evaluate the efficacy of those products. And then you'll probably have to be doing this until harvest, essentially, so for several weeks. SD uh, Martin Tattoo asks, are white maggots good? Well, uh, maggots are just a larvae of flies, so I'm not really sure what you're uh, dealing with necessarily. If they kind of look like housefly larvae, it's probably not great. If they look like fungus gnat larvae, which you can check on my fungus gnat presentation, for the Bredesia darkwing fungus gnats, which are the most common that people deal with, they have like a red, they have like a black head capsule and they have like a white body. And usually people see the later stages that are looking for a place to pupate in the topsoil. Those are not generally considered great. You know, you might mistake them for like potworms, which are like kind of like an earthworm type organism, or literal er earthworms potentially if they're very small. So just be aware. And uh, if you have a question, please just uh, send me a message on my website, xenthanol.com or comment on my YouTube channel or send me a picture on Instagram or something like that. I'd be happy to take a look. Do springtails cause any harm to cannabis? Asks Sir Kenneth. Sir Kenneth, um, not generally, no. Um, I would say that in the cases where springtails might cause problems, might be when their population is extremely large, docking thousands, and perhaps you have another issue that's going on and they can exacerbate that problem. But generally speaking, there's all kinds of springtails, all kinds of different shapes and sizes. Um, 
and there's all kinds of uh, lifestyles. So some of them are fungivorous, a lot of them are omnivorous, and in some way a detrivorous. So that means that they eat all kinds of things, animal matter, plant matter, fungal matter, microbial matter, you know. And they might also eat decaying organic matter as a detrivore. So it's hard to say in a lot of cases, but mo a lot of them are typically not herbivorous, or they are only mildly. Enough that you wouldn't have to worry about it in, in most cases. So Scoots Genetics asks, what are your thoughts on systemic pesticides for cannabis? And then later on asks, or should I say systemic pesticides in potted plants? No, you can say either one. Well, I don't really like them. There's a there's a there's various reasons why I don't think they're very um, applicable to cannabis in particular. One is that you never know. I've encountered at this point enough times people who think they can play sort of fast and loose with the chemistry. They might know enough to be dangerous with some of these compounds, by which I mean they might know that a systemic pesticide, so there's different kinds of pesticides. There's some that are translaminar, some that are just not systemic at all, right? They don't get into the tissue, okay? So those are the typical ones I'm talking about that I recommend. Some of them are translaminar, which means that they hit the tissue and then they pass through the tissue, and there's various ways that this happens depending on the chemical, and uh, they kind of stay in that tissue generally. So if you hit the, the leaves or you, look, you hit half of the plant, it kind of just stays in that half, wherever the chemical landed. Let's say you were being very precise for whatever reason, or it's just spill off from another spray. Um, then you can get true, sort of true, fully systemic things that will, wherever, if you drench apl apply to the roots, it will go into the foliage, it will travel up. If you hit the leaves, it will travel down and then travel into other um, leaf tissue and things like that. So, in general, those aren't very useful for us because, for one thing, you don't really want to expose people to the end product because it, oftentimes it stays for a long period of time in the plant. And what a lot of people like to, not a lot, but in my case, it's been enough people <laughs> that have said, well, what if I just time it? What if I just, what if I just applied it in the beginning and just time it? Well, are you testing? Do you know how much that chemical is in the tissue? How, what is the, um, What's the safe amount? You tell me. I don't know. I think most people don't know. So honestly, I think it's not something you should be doing, to be honest. That's my, that's my honest opinion. The other reason why is because you get uh, other sort of unfortunate ecological effects, especially if you're growing outdoors um, or in the greenhouse where you're still somewhat exposed or other organisms can come in and become exposed to these compounds. Uh, for one thing, there's a research report that showed that uh, powdery mildew can uptake some of these systemic insecticides and then when some insects that eat fungi, like for example the uh, 20 spotted lady beetle, Silobora, um, it actually eats powdery mildew, believe it or not, and I have a few videos on that on my channel too if you're curious to know more, uh, but it will kill the lady beetle that would normally have eaten the powdery mildew. So that sucks and you know is another reason why you know, some, you can have effects like these that happen. The systemic uh, pesticide can get into the nectaries of plants, right? So then a honeybee or, or a native bee or a solitary bee comes in, drinks the nectar, and is maybe not killed, but maybe has a sublethal effect. Maybe it screws up their gut microbiome. Uh, you know, maybe they are more susceptible to a predator. Maybe the predator gets sick too, right? So there's all of these effects that I think are really not worth it, to be honest. Trevor Payne asks, can you provide more examples of common antagonisms you encounter in the field? This is probably my fault for using a general term like antagonism, um, but uh, I'm curious to know more what you mean by that. Um, antagonism to what and from where? And if you clarify that, I'll definitely ask that, I'll answer that question. Okay, antagonisms between biocontrol agents, environmental practices, and biostimulants and pesticides. Okay, cool, yeah. So this is a good question. Um, so uh, I already mentioned predatory mites and like sulfur, for example, that's a really common one. People often ask me about, this is like, an, this is not what you ask, but a common misconception about antagonism is that people are um, concerned that you, if you apply certain predatory mites together, uh, that you might get what's called uh, intergild or intraguild predation. So 
basically, uh, will your bio will your bio controls attack each other? Not just predatory mice, but other bio controls. There are some cases where you might get some of that, but a big aspect of bio control research in general, and I have um, videos on my YouTube channel that go over this if you're curious to learn more. Um, specifically in the phytoseity Phyto playlist, which I will link in my uh, description for this video and also I will show an example in the edit and the visual but basically um, this typically doesn't happen because a lot of research is focused on making sure that the biocontrols that are selected uh, typically don't do this that people are using and also if they do have this sort of effect that they're well they're discovered before people use them in a production facility so way in the pre-planning stage like recently, um, there was a micro predatory mite that I posted about on this channel, this uh, account actually, that is being used for recipe mite, recipe mite control and also other kinds of control as well because they're very small and they have a, a very voracious appetite. You know, you might have a negative effect with other biocontrols potentially if it was like newer. There's also the whirly gig mite, uh, which is sometimes being called the crazy mite, uh, anesis. Um, that genus, they're very common, or they're becoming more common, they're kind of newer on the, in the production um, world for biocontrols, and they're kind of a generalist too, they'll go after thrips and whitefly, and spider mites too, they're kind of a very robust mite, very red, kind of look like persimilis. That would be a mite that potentially one might think, oh, does that one also feed on predatory mites potentially, but uh, usually, even if there is some overlap, some uh, predation, uh, typically, it doesn't happen to an extent that's going to affect the overall success or failure of your treatment program. So you don't have to worry about that in most cases. Um, for environmental practices or for biosimilants and things, you know, people who uh, follow me, they know that I like to wax a lot of poetic about, uh, you know, immune signaling response and plant physiology. And that's kind of a little bit more advanced, maybe a little bit out of the scope of the basics of IPM. Um, but basically, I will say that uh, even if you use things like mycorrhizae or, well, there's, a, there's an example, right? So some people know this already, but mycorrhizae and some other uh, mutualistic microbes that can interact with plants, well, those relationships have a cost, okay? People don't think about this a lot, but there's a massive ecological um, ramification for mutualism. And that is that typically, not always, but typically we find that in, in, uh, in scarce or austere environments, the mutualism is a lot more helpful for both organisms. And that kind of makes intuitive sense, right? So when the resources are scarce, this relationship is oftentimes more facilitated, uh, the immune system is more, um, for lack of a better term, receptive to organisms, sort of um, like mycorrhizae, to sort of uh, sort of break into their roots and uh, modulate their own genetic expression, for that matter, in the root system, and sort of attenuate the immune response and um, kind of create this relationship where they're produ where they're uh, mining for phosphorus and water and things like that in the soil and then they are packaging it up and sending it off to the plant then they receive in they receive uh, hexose which is a type of uh, sugar carbohydrate as a metabolic source of food basically and other sugars and other things like that and so that relationship is great when resources are not poor when they're very um, high, especially in agricultural settings where people are literally applying organic matter or you know, straight up fertilizer, for example, this relationship is often highly attenuated or it doesn't even occur. And that's because there's no reason to have that cost, right? There's no reason to for the, for the plant to, um, and I'm not like speaking for the plants here, like I've talked to them and ask them how they feel about mutualism. This is coming from research and that kind of a thing. But interpretation in research is that those effects don't occur because um, there's no need to, to um, take that cost of the mutualism. They can just get those nutrients themselves. So, you know, uh, that's an, an important aspect of plants and their immune signaling response. So 
what you're doing, how you're applying things can definitely affect, even if you're growing organically or regeneratively or in a living soil um, system, you know, you must make use of like your theoretical knowledge of ecology and you must make use of the research about these organisms uh, to make informed decisions because um, even if you're using techniques that have been, you know, uh, uh, how do I put this? They've been used for a long time in human history in various cultures and they might be very effective certainly especially because you know you're giving nutrients and other sorts of microbes and organisms to the plant you don't always necessarily know exactly what's in what you're applying and you don't necessarily know what relationships are occurring because it's invisible to our eyes we can make inferences based on effects and results but ultimately even if you were to take sort of a microbial evaluation and you, you know, genome sequence everything in, a so in the soil, you're still only getting a snapshot of a moment in time, and that changes over time. So that's more advanced, uh, but you know, I can't resist the opportunity to talk about um, this sort of a thing. Another example is biostimulants where you might... So we've learned that biopriming is great for plants in certain ways because almost all pests, whether they're a fungus or a bacteria or an insect or a mite, they all have some way to uh, damage or attenuate or shut off the immune system response to their presence. Or, like in the case of spider mites, they like to uh, incite a response, but they like to incite the wrong response. Uh, to their presence and that actually helps them and actually negatively affects their competitors which are other herbivores on the plant. That's kind of an interesting concept, right? So because of that, because we know that there's this sort of silencing effect, this sort of attenuation effect that occurs, if we bioprime, if we know, like with the budworm question, if we know that you know it's spider mite season, like the next couple of weeks or whatever, we're going to get spider mites like we always do, or we often get a pest during this time, like in summer is very common when it's hotter, um, you might consider biopriming your plants because if you use the right stimulant and you basically um, cause the plant to have an immune response when there's no actual threat, then when the threat is actually there, you can, you know, basically they're much more effective against the organism in a way that's almost like alien to what would normally happen. But that's because we're sort of artificially changing this response using the fact that we know what's going on, the plant's not really aware of what's going on in that way. The downfall of that though is that if you don't apply at the right time, then you will harm your plant because for one, there's resources involved in priming and also the effect is not always uh, long lasting. The priming effect might be only an hour. You know, it might only be a day. It might only be a few days. If you prime at the wrong time, you're going to deplete a bunch of metabolic resources and when the, the pest does occur at a time later on, then that priming might be not there at all and it might also be at a significant metabolic um, cost to the plant that would actually still have some or more resources available to counteract. If that makes sense, it's a little bit complicated. It's definitely based on our understanding of plant physiology and ecology. I love talking about it, but you know, I, I will probably have to make another video. Uh, well, when I'm voting for the next, when we're doing voting for the next topic, you guys can, you know, maybe I'll put advanced IPM uh, information on the next one and we can talk about some of those topics too. But hopefully that sort of um, uh, explains some of those neat little effects that are kind of hard to um, see in the field. To terp underscore S asks, can you touch on the proper application of wettable sulfur in a greenhouse setting? Thanks. Well, it depends on your greenhouse setting. A lot of these answers are going to be, it depends. Um, later on in the comments, somebody says that you could apply something else. Where is it? Yeah, they said two to three tablespoons per gallon of sulfur for full years. That was Trevor, again, Trevor Payne. Um, uh, yeah, it really, it, really does, it really does depend. A lot of times, you know, oftentimes there's going to be a label associated with your wettable sulfur, and usually the label rate's fine in my experience. There's typically no reason to, like, go over that. You could also have a lot of toxic problems if you do that as well. As far as uh, proper application though, if we're just talking about application and not like the mixing or any of that, 
Um, full coverage is really important. So getting on the tops of the leaves, a lot of insects and other organisms will be on the bottoms of the leaves as well. So being able to apply at the top and then also to the bottom is very important. Obviously keeping uh, your protective equipment on, making sure that um, you know you're not getting it into your lungs, that you're not breathing it in and things like that. And also it probably doesn't need to be said but I've encountered this enough to say that I just want to reiterate, we're talking about wettable sulfur, we're talking about applying it as a mixture with water. We are not talking about burning sulfur, which creates sulfur dioxide, which is incredibly toxic to your lungs and has a strong residue and is not great to get into cannabis and also other plants for that matter as well. So I just want to re-emphasize that point. Uh, Dro CC asks, uh, can tobacco mosaic virus and hop latent viroid be in the seeds? Uh, at the very least for uh, hop latent viroid, yes, it can be seed transmissible. I'd like to see a little bit more research about those dynamics. I'm sure that we'll see more of that in the coming months and years. There's a lot of really talented people working on exactly this question and uh, sort of extrapolating from it. As far as tobacco mosaic virus, I actually think that I have read research that says that there are some cases where TMV can be in the seeds, but I think that is either a specific strain or it might be confusing with a different uh, virus in the orthotoxovirus genus. So uh, I will I will definitely have edited information in the video follow-up. Nahui.Palan Palan? says, Hello, I'm writing to you from Argentina. We are having a lot of problems with red spider mites and powdery mildew, or oidio, which, I familiar, which I'm familiar with that phrase when I'm working with people here in San Diego, California. Um, you know, we definitely had a lot of conversations in, uh, in Spanish about powdery mildew, mancha blanca, and other sorts of things like that. Um, so, yeah, so, so red spider mites, I assume this is probably the two-spot spider mite because uh, that's the most common one people t uh, typically interact with, but there are many others out there in powdery mildew. I'm not sure what the crop is, that's actually a very important contextual cue here for, for what we would do, but um, assuming, I'm going <laughs> to assume it's cannabis, that's probably not a fair assumption. But sure, generally speaking, uh, sort of crop agnostically, you might try to do things like use uh, potassium bicarbonate. That's a chemical product that you could use for powdery mildew that's effective. There's a lot of different products out there. Um, and in agricultural space, there's several, there are many out there that you can access that you would be able to use for powdery mildew control. And in my experience, it, it works very well. It's not harsh on the plant. Um, and in my powdery mildew presentation, I do go over how how it actually affects the powdery mildew itself. Um, it's a pretty pretty harmless way for us, you know, to, to affect the powdery mildew essentially. A big part of it is changing the pH on the surface and also really playing havoc with its uh, physiology essentially. With the spider mites, however, there's a lot of things that you could do. You could use a persimilis mites. Phytocilius persimilis is a type 1a predatory mite from the McMurtry scale. If you're curious to know more about that, I have a video on my YouTube channel too. But essentially there are specialists that are evolved. They've co-evolved with spider mites and they have many adaptations that allow them to travel on their silk, break through their silk better than others. The type one lifestyle is described in this way. Since the first attempt to classify the phytoceids according to their feeding habits, the specificity of certain phytoceid assemblages two mite prey groups, other than titronychids, was pointed out by different authors. Thus, type 1 lifestyle is now considered to include phytoceids that are specialized predators of different mite groups. This led to the need to divide this lifestyle type into three subgroups. Most people are familiar with the subtype 1a, specialized predators of Tetronychus, the genus in Tetronychidae. This subtype contains phytoceids that have adapted to attacking spider mites producing the so-called complicated web. Until now, the examples refer to phytoceids associated with the Tetronychus genus. However, it is possible that these predators can also be effective as control agents of spider mites of other genera, also known to produce the complicated web U-type. Saito mentioned some species of Eotetronychus as also producing that web type. Perhaps the most well-recognized predatory mite against spider mites is 
Phytocilius persimilis. And this is for good reason. According to the research report, these predators could have co-evolved with Tetranicus species. Phytocilius persimilis is very good at getting rid of spider mites. However, it does have advantages and disadvantages when compared to other predatory mites. Its usage should be based on the context of the cultivation space, what the resources are that are available, how often they can be utilized, how large the space is, and other factors. They have voracious appetite, especially for eggs and larvae, because they don't fight back <laughs> uh, as much as the adults do. Um, so I like Persimilis. You can also use Stathoris punctillum. Again, in my spider mite presentation, I have a whole section that goes over biocontrols and various different ones from various different types of organisms, insects and mites, and even some fungi that are parasites of spider mites too. So there are definitely several things that you can use for them. And uh, you know, you can use, as we mentioned earlier, potentially, assuming that uh, you know, everything is copacetic, you can even use buttable sulfur to kill tubers with one stone um, because it will affect the spider mites and will also affect the powdery mildew negatively as well. So you might have other contexts that make that not a good move, but you know, without knowing that context, I'm not sure. But hopefully that has been sort of useful for you. Dark Dragon Genetics comments that they lost a nine foot tall plant this season due to moth caterpillars. Yeah, it's a really egregious problem that a lot of people are dealing with. In fact, I wrote a Skunk Magazine article about that recently uh, because 2022 to me was the summer of the budworm moth. Certainly 2021 and, 2020 and, and 2019 and 2018 and some, for some people were also the summers of the budworm moth, but I felt like I encountered it more with clients than previously and it definitely needed to be talked about in general. So. New Roots Gardens asks, can you talk a little about innovations in IPM practices in greenhouse settings? Uh, yeah, I could talk a little bit about that. For one thing, I had mentioned the Pats C and the Pats X, the drone that kills the moth caterpillars, or the moths in flight. Um, that's a two-part system. Uh, it's made by uh, some uh, Dutch growers and uh, horticultural technologists, <laughs> however you want to put it. They are very good at what they do, and um, basically it uses an IR scanner, and it can detect these moths at night, of course, because that's when they're active usually. You're probably asleep at this time, so the IR scanner can detect them in real time. It can show where they were in the greenhouse space, so it's all mapped out on a grid. A software component that goes with it, so basically you can check where it detected these moths and which ones. Again, it can discriminate between some species, not all. It's really fascinating. I have a, on my budworm video, I do go over it and it shows some of these capabilities that the software program gives you. And of course, the Pats X system is the drone that goes out and uh, myrtleizes them. And that's pretty cool. I think there's a, a lot of benefit to that. And I'm particularly excited about how it's uh, discriminating between different mods. I haven't talked with them in great detail or anything like that, but I could in the future for, for us, and that'd be an interesting topic. But I like that innovation. That one's really cool coming out. I didn't know that there was a name for this. I knew it, actually I knew it with a different name, but there's a, a different name that I'm forgetting at the moment and I will put it in the edit here for your edification. But basically, for me, I called it my quarantine system or the QSYS. And that was when I had asked the uh, greenhouse mechanic to basically create a box with screen that allowed, and also uh, an irrigation system. Well, one that can connect to the irrigation system that was there. And basically I designed and then had him produce it and basically how it would work. There's also like a, um, there was a jar that would twist into the uh, structure as well on one of the sides. And basically the way it worked is it was meant to be like a furnace that you would put coal into, but instead of fire and coal, you would have uh, uh, the pests on the Gerbera daisies, disconnect them from the irrigation spitter, you'd put them in the box, the box held, I want to say 12, because it w we measured it out, and basically there are other systems that do this, essentially, probably better than our, uh, our, in our, um, <laughs> our own innovations, but basically you put the pest-ridden plants into this place or you might just take the leaves or something, potentially. You put it in this box, you put the biocontrols in it, 
and the biocontrols will feed and reproduce on these pests and you can basically super concentrate them in one area. And then the benefit, in some cases with the screen, we were dealing with leaf miner and um, leaf miner is a big problem in a lot of vegetable crops and ornamentals. And basically what we were doing is we were also using diglyphus wasps, which are pretty expensive, uh, but very effective. Um, but what we would do is is we would put the plants into the system and then uh, we would apply the diglyphus in and the screen that I sourced and I took a lot of effort to like um, to evaluate and make sure it worked we had the screen small enough that the leaf miners couldn't get out large enough that the diglyphus wasps could passively egress into the crop so we would put this box into the crop or into the greenhouse connect it to the irrigation we'd fill it up with leaf miner ridden plants, the hot spots, we put the diglyphus in, and about a week or two later, uh, all the leaf miners would be dead, and the diglyphus that had spawned from the larvae that they parasitized, they would become adults, and they would just passively go into the crop. And we measured this, and we could see, we could definitely tell when we put the boxes in each greenhouse, which ones we did and which ones we didn't, because we had a significant increase of diglyphus and a significant decrease. We had uh, crop scouts that were using iPads to track our presence absence and all that and uh, also we had yellow cards that we would input the data for every week so all that is to say that there's a system out there where you can basically take pests and you can put them into a um, sort of a controlled area and you can kind of bio control them there you know, kind of use it as like a constant source of sort of quick bio control treatment it doesn't work for all plants necessarily but it is something that I think is going to become more and more useful to people um, over time. Actually, I also think it's pretty simple, low-tech um, uh, treatment, and I'm a big fan of things that are very cheap to implement, not problematic for the environment, easy to implement. So, Uptown Rick asks, what's a good IPM for fungus gnats? In my opinion, my favorite way to treat fungus gnats, if it's practicable, is to use styronema felsiae nematodes. You can use Bacillus thuringiensis in some cases. There are some BT products that you can use, but I'm a big fan of using the nematodes. There are some people who sometimes have issues with using them for various reasons. One of the biggest ways that um, they are not applied correctly is that people don't like to, people don't know to use the uh, uh, a pump or something to agitate the water when you're mixing them and watering them in. If you don't agitate the water and also sort of oxygenate it that way, then one, the nematodes might die. Um, but the other one is that you're not going to be applying any nematodes because they're all sinking to the bottom. So you don't get an even distribution. You get no nematodes or practically no nematodes and at the very end you get all the nematodes however you're watering them in. So you should be aware of that when you're using something like that. Another thing is that fungus gnats are really common, super pernicious, not a huge threat in most cases, although they do vector some pathogens. So another thing to keep in mind is you might treat them and you kill all of them and then you start to get them again. And this happens sometimes with nematodes too. And so sometimes that's because very close to your area, you might have a place where fungus gnats are able to breed. Maybe you have a leaky pipe, I've encountered that. Maybe you have a faucet outside in a greenhouse space where it's often wet, or there's a place where the water and the rain tends to run off. Things like that. So if you're able to sort of control that, get rid of that sort of a thing, then that can be really helpful. So Trichronic asks, what are your personal favorite powdery mildew solutions and preventatives? I already mentioned the, the potassium bicarbonate products. That's one of my favorites to use. As far as preventative approaches are concerned, um, a lot of it has to do with our understanding of the life cycle of powdery mildew. Powdery mildew spores, and for that matter, botrytis spores and a lot of other fungal pathogen spores are kind of everywhere. They're kind of, um, they're always around. So the name of the game is not to eliminate them coming into your grow space because unless you grow in a clean room and have no substrate, no soil, no nothing, everything is clean and um, highly sterilized, uh, you're probably going to have uh, fungus. And, eat, and, and for that matter, if you're not wearing a clean suit, you are probably going to add to the microbiome of that area in various ways or various ways that that can happen. Um, I won't go into the details, I'm sure you can imagine what I'm talking about here, but basically keep the environment controlled. 
uh, keep it from getting a little bit too humid. Powdered mildew spores don't actually need a lot of humidity to germinate. Like I said earlier, they carry a lot of water in their spore, uh, in the spore itself. Uh, but Botrytis, for example, doesn't, and so they really like the, uh, the extra humidity and leaf moisture. Um, so for powdery mildew, one thing that you can do is uh, keep the uh, surface humidity from not increasing. The relative humidity is kind of whatever, but having like actual a little bit of moisture on the, the surface, it does help after the spores have germinated. They don't need the help before they've germinated, but then once you have that mycelium on the surface there, if the humidity is high enough and you have compact inflorescences and things like that, that's how you can get bud rot too for botrytis. But I have also sometimes seen powdery mildew go from the uh, leaves um, and into the flower. Of course, I'm talking about cannabis here. As far as things like peppers, for example, or Gerber, I definitely encountered a lot of powdery mildew in that space. And also when I was in China, we definitely encountered powdery mildew in, ser in, in several crops. Basically, an important thing to do is to kind of just keep at it with your preventative. If you're growing in a place where it's like exposed to the elements, then this is becoming a lot harder to do and it's a little bit less tenable. In that case, I'd probably rely more on things like the potassium bicarbonate and having a sort of regular scheduled um, interview, uh, interval of application. Uh, if you don't have that and you're more of in a controlled space, then if you can control the environments and sort of keep things um, sort of stable and kind of lower in temperature, then that can keep the uh, mildew from kind of growing expansively, essentially. And then another thing that you can potentially implement for some people is the use of uh, ultraviolet C radiation, so UVC. That is a little bit more technical and it usually requires, um, you know, sort of a significant setup uh, that, to do this effectively and without hurting your plants too. Because UVC, it harms yourself as well. It can be damaging to your eyes, your skin. It can also be damaging to uh, the leaves, right? So um, you do have to do that in an effective way. And that's probably talking about all of that is probably outside the scope of this video, but. Um, I did want to mention it because it's a lot more commonplace more and more. Never Not Nolan asks, what is your process like for crop scouting? My process for crop scouting is absolutely based on the cultivation context of the growth space. But generally speaking, I like to, when I'm, when I'm training folks about crop scouting, I like to talk about a few different strategies. Different people have different opinions about this. For me, I like to use the random, not not actually mathematically random, but a sort of a perspective that seeks to eliminate um, sort of an observational bias that is very common where people will get into their habits and especially in you know, like a large greenhouse or something, then maybe they have rows of crops or things like that, where they just kind of check the same places all the time. Now maybe they check specific places because historically that's where things sort of concentrate. I've definitely worked in greenhouses where, um, you know, they're old or for whatever reason they just kind of, they kind of are built awkwardly or not symmetrically or, um, or otherwise they're just something weird. Like for example, in a, in a Gerber grower that I worked with, they had a boiler room that powered all of their heating and everything and that boiler room was right next to a greenhouse and wouldn't you know it the data showed uh, that we tend to get a more significant pest pressure in that space it's like in the middle of this greenhouse where it was, it was this sort of long form uh, greenhouse um, and uh, basically everywhere in the beginning and the end was kind of more homogenous, but right next to the, the boiler, which is also where there was a water heater system, uh, there were plants that would, there was a row, of, there was like a short row that would go up to there. And it tended to be a place where I think the, the air was warmer, more humid from the heat, of course. Um, all of those things played a factor. And, and so they would check that place specifically. So there are places, there are reasons to do that. You also might check uh, at this, of course, at the start of entrances and exits and any other sort of like entry point uh, more. You might, in some cases, you might try to look at the perimeter instead of doing like rows or things like that, uh, depending on how you're growing and that sort of a thing. But usually my process is to do a sort of a random selection. So 
uh, depending, of course, on your resources, your personnel, your logistics, and all that kind of thing, ideally, you want to be at least, you want to be ideally looking at everything. The true ideal would be a census. So not just a, a proportion of your plants, but literally looking at every single plant. If you're able to do that, that is the superior thing to do. And then when you're looking at the plants, you're not just looking at them and going, okay, and then going to the next one. If you want to look at the leaves, usually I like to set up a standard where depending on the plant and depending on the pests that you're dealing with that are most problematic, uh, like in cannabis, for example, you know, you want to look at the bud, you want to look at the leaves, you want to look at a certain amount of leaves as standard, uh, so that you're looking at every plant with the same standard. You don't look at like a couple of leaves here and more leaves there. You could do that, but generally speaking, it's better to have a setup where you have a certain amount of leaves, a certain amount of plants that you're checking the roots for, for like rice root aphid, for example, or other sorts of ailments, pathogens, and things like that. And then, you know, that way you have sort of a standard for understanding what you did when you checked, and so that you know that you're not, like, uh, checking too lightly for everyone, any one plant. Basically, you're being thorough enough that you'd be able to see the signs of a small pest population, whatever that one might be that you're checking for, um, or the ones that you would be checking for, essentially, because you don't know what's going to be there. Uh, whereas, like, for example, in Gerbera, you know, we also checked the flowers, we checked the leaves, we checked the roots as well, we checked the crown of the plant, right? And we would check for things like breakage, damage, sometimes the, the harvesters, the cortadoras, would, uh, they would break off the stem instead of, they would, there's like a way that you could break the stem off, there's like a heel, like a celery heel, you know? Um, and it would kind of, it would snap off sort of cleanly, but uh, for a period of time, uh, due to the administration asking the uh, cultivators to harvest more quickly, they were incentivized to just break the stem off. Well, unfortunately, um, that stem got infected. A lot of juicy assimilated sugars would just leach out of the wound, and then uh, fruit flies would come in, and we also got a very unique pest that you normally wouldn't get. We got pineapple beetles and um, uh, strawberry beetles, which are both nitidulids, which are the sap feeding beetles, um, and uh, then those vectored a yeast that would also colonize the heel. So little idiosyncrasies like that can definitely um, have an influence on how you're going through your process for crop scouting. Um, hopefully that was thorough enough. Odd I see asks dew points. Do you think it's better to be in to be on the drier side? and then letting it get to 60% or 65% relative humidity? You know, that's a good question. Generally speaking, I don't like it to get super humid for the fungal component. Um, it it kind of depends on what you're growing and that sort of a thing. If you do let things get too humid, then certainly, like I already mentioned, a lot of fungi like that sort of a thing a lot. 60 to 65%. So there's a problem potentially with that, which is that if you're relying on certain biocontrols, then if it's too dry, a lot of biocontrols, they might be able to find microclimates in and amongst the plants that are higher humidity. And in some cases, so 60 to 65 is not so super terrible really, but if you do let it get drier than that, like 40% or 30%, which is pretty, pretty dry in a lot of places, anything lower than 50% I think can cause some sort of stress for some biocontrols like predatory mites because they're so small and you know, the way that they breathe, the way that they um, exist, they have a very thin sort of body that allows them to kind of um, breathe appropriately and that sort of a thing. I think it's simple diffusion, passive diffusion, I think, for some, some mites anyway, some, some small organisms are like that. So if it's too dry, basically, they will dry out, they will, they, or they will just seek out certain shelters and they won't be as mobile. The other problem is that at least for predatory mites, in particular like Swirskii, Cumarus, or Simulus, things like that, their eggs might dry out, and then you don't get that uh, that sort of second generation or third generation benefit that is oftentimes the benefit of a bulk release or an inoculative release, both because in the bulk case they're all going to hopefully you know take a stab at several of these pests, and maybe the first generation kind of you know, reduces it to one-tenth. It truly decimates the population. Uh, but if that doesn't happen, 
you know, the second generation will, or the third generation will sort of annihilate the rest of those, those pests. But if it's too dry, then the eggs will not necessarily, or some of them or all of them might die, and then you might have to reapply more, or you just won't have the efficacy that you might be expecting because of all these small little details. But generally speaking, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. It definitely is context dependent though. Pot Poncho asks, other than sulfur, what do you recommend for those russet mites? Feel like there's years they are dropping from the sky. Oh yeah, this is the Caltrans, um, so, aka Caltrans. So that's not a thing. Um, that's a very common misconception. I have a cannabis cultivation myths video on my YouTube channel, Xenthanol, and I go over the myth of the Caltrans application. So this is why it's important to know the life cycle and the biology of your pests, because if you don't know them, you might think that Caltrans is producing hemp russet mite and then applying it to everyone uh, surreptitiously in order to get rid of the uh, cannabis cultivation that's going on. Well, unfortunately, that would be uh, really terrible for the government. So for those who don't know, uh, for those who don't live in California or are foreign to the United States, Caltrans, the California Department of Transportation. Caltrans, several years ago, created um, a program for, or was looking into creating a program rather, for controlling uh, various tumbleweeds because, and tumbleweeds for those who don't know, if you've ever seen like a western or a spaghetti western movie, you know, like the good, the bad, and the ugly or something like that, something classic, you know, it's very much, it's often depicted in the desert, you have like a, those plants that are like spherical, and they're dried up and they tumble across the, the desert. This is how they get around, this is how they disperse their seeds actually, and several tumbleweed species are actually toxic, noxious, uh, invasive um, plants. When I say toxic, I really just mean that they're toxic to the environment generally, not that they're poisonous. But what I mean also is that they can significantly impact the roads. They're a, they're a huge problem. If they get stuck in your in your car, or if a bunch of them are on the road and you just drive right through them, that can damage your, your car. It can damage people's houses too. Uh, there's examples where the tumbleweeds, so many of them travel in a group that they actually just get everywhere on people's lawns and and kind of uh, can cause a little bit of damage to property and things like that. So they're trying to get rid of them and because of the Department of Transportation, they're a, they are a potential threat to certain things like that. So they were looking to get rid of them and they checked out a couple of biocontrol agents potentially. One of them was a russet mite, but for those who don't know, russet mites, the Aerophyidae, they are almost entirely specialists. There are almost no species that are generalists or that go after a bunch of different plants in uh, that are like not closely related and the vast and I know a lot of cannabis growers are going to be surprised to hear this but the vast majority of russet mites are totally innocuous to their host they feed on their host they cause no problematic symptoms they don't cause the gnarling and curling of the leaves that we often associate in cannabis for example and in aloe and in citrus because they also get russet mites too so russet mites are specialists, they won't go after other plants. I, I really want to emphasize this point because it's a, it's a pretty common uh, misconception about russet mites. So in the report, they talked about a tumbleweed russet mite, and I believe it was uh, called Assyria solani or something like that. Um, and uh, people read this and they saw russet mite, they saw the picture, and their only context for a russet mite is the hemp russet mite. And they just, you know, people were like, the government is trying to kill cannabis by applying russet mites everywhere. And that's, that's bad because if the government was trying to do that, then they would have to grow a bunch of cannabis for the russet mites to grow on and then somehow collect them and then somehow apply them. And again, for people who don't know, russet mite physiology is very uh, simple. They reproduce very quickly. They only live for like, you know, a little bit over a week or two potentially. So it would be incredibly difficult for them to grow them, grow their food, grow them, collect them, and then somehow efficiently disperse them along IO5. 
it wouldn't work very well. Uh, it's also why the program that I'm just uh, probably why the program I'm just describing didn't actually go through. So that's the other thing. That was just a report, a potential report that they were trying to do, and then that didn't actually lead to anywhere as far as I know. So they didn't actually end up using the um, the salsolamite for the uh, the one of the tumbleweed species they were targeting. So I, I've now I've talked about that part. Now I'll talk about your actual question. What do I recommend for those damn resin mites? Basically, there's sulfur, of course, but I like to use predatory mites uh, a lot of times, like Swirsky and Cucumeris. And I've also heard people say that there's no research that sort of backs this up or that people have used them and have not had effect or good effect. That actually happens with a lot of biocontrols where people are. Uh, suspicious about their use and particularly back when they were first being um, utilized uh, more extensively uh, there was a lot of problems with their application people didn't people not only the growers but also the advisors who were trying to use biocontrols did have problems with them but there's definitely research that shows that various predatory mites do go after rest of mites like tomato rest of mite and that sort of a thing the new predatory mite I had mentioned earlier in the post and I'm not remembering the name off the top of my head because it's so new Promata something or other I forget but um, you can check out my posts on my on my account it's very it's pretty recent and basically it's from a different family that most people aren't familiar with for predatory mites and uh, it could also potentially be used I, this is speculative on my part but I have definitely worked with many clients at this point where we use something like Swirskii or Cucumeris and over time the rest of my population is treated and is controlled and I've definitely come across researchers and I will put their information here, their references. I also made a post recently talking about this very topic because it's a controversial subject. A lot of people have heard that it's not a great idea to use certain biocontrols or that there's no evidence that they're going to be useful against hemp mite in particular. I think that's a little bit more contentious and I've had good effect with it where there wasn't any other uh, conflating variables, like it's not like we applied, uh, in some cases we didn't apply any knockdown, be especially because you don't want to use something like sulfur in flour. I don't think I've actually said that exact statement yet and uh, I really want to make sure that that's uh, emphasized here and I'll probably emphasize it in the edit when I first mention rest of my treatment. And yeah, you should, or sulfur, so that you shouldn't use it in flour for growing cannabis, for example. So that's my opinion on that. I have a rest of my predatory mite video on my YouTube channel that goes over some of the research that sort of talks about their use for rest of, for rest of mites in general, and then uh, my own opinions about using them in particular there. So you can get more information there as well. Olive Dove asks, are praying mantises effective biocontrol for cannabis? You know. No, I wouldn't say that they really are. A lot of the biocontrols that people think of when they think biocontrol, they think of things that are very easy for us to recognize, or we might use the term charismatic fauna. So like, uh, if, everyone, if anyone's ever heard the Bambi effect, effect where humans will look at like cute cuddly mammals and we will, you know, have fond feelings for them uh, because of their cute cuddly mammalness because we're mammals, as the interpretation goes. But a lot of insects don't really get that. But they do if they look cool, or if they're very large or impressive in some way, shape, or form, very colorful. Lady beetles, praying mantises, those two are big ones. And they're also very commonly applied, and they're commonly bought, and a lot of times they're harvested destructively from the environment. Uh, many people have talked about this with regards to lady beetles, including myself. Some species are not actually very good to use. They are exotic to the area, like the harlequin lady beetle, Harmonia axiridis, which also will eat native lady beetles. We talked earlier about intergild predation. That is what that is. And if you're curious why some predators will eat other predators, it's competition. It's so that they, their population can be, I mean, it's not like there's an intellectual consideration coming from the lady beetle, but the reason why this uh, trait is um, conserved uh, in so many organisms that are predators is because what, what the result of that is, is that it allows their young, which are probably going to be nearby where they're being active, it increases their likelihood of survival. Um, and so that's why it's useful. So, so these Harmonia lady beetles are commonly used. Uh, they bite humans, 
uh, in some cases, although I've never been bitten personally, I've known people who have. They also exude like a yellow, a very strong, smelly yellow residue, uh, which some people have been fortunate enough to interact with, like myself. And in some places they will huddle for warmth. Other lady beetles do this too, but they will get into your, they'll try to get into your house. Um, in some places they'll get very, very large populations will just kind of be in a shed or something. Um, and that's not really something people want to deal with. It gets very acrid and, and, and it smells very terrible and that kind of a thing. So they're sort of a pest too, but people don't know that. And the people who are, who are selling them don't care or don't know or both. So yeah, I'm not a big fan of lady beetles in general unless they're a commercial lady beetle species that is meant for a specific pest. So people know, a lot of people know lady beetles, a lot of them eat uh, aphids. Not all of them eat aphids. A lot of, it's like the Silobora I mentioned that eats a powdery mildew, for example, or the Sithorus punctillum is a lady beetle. It eats spider mites. So there's a lot of different lady beetles out there. But yes, a lot of species often go after aphids. You want to use the right one for your area. Uh, Hippodemia convergens, the convergent lady beetle is really popular in North America, for example. And if you're going to use a lady beetle for aphids, you might want to use that one. Try to use other biocontrols that are actually just more efficient, to be honest. As far as mantises are concerned, they are, in my opinion, even less efficient than the lady beetles, primarily because most pests that people deal with are small. Spider mites, super small. Rest of mites, very small, smaller than spider mites. Well, various microbes, but those don't count, I don't, I don't think. People aren't really applying mantises for that. You know, caterpillars are kind of bigger, stink bugs are kind of bigger, but usually, in most cases, you're not dealing with a ton of them, and the budworms are going to burrow in. The hemp borer is going to burrow into the stem, for example. But for caterpillars that live, like, on the leaves, maybe they would go after that, but it's usually just not worth it. They look cool, and they're interesting, and they'll eat each other, too. Uh, but even as small nymphs, they're generally not going to be going after... I have some video of them going after some predatory mites uh, in a terrarium that I set up once um, to prove the point that they can visually identify and then go after them, but they're, they're not going to eat very many either. That's the other problem with praying mantises, and also some lady beetles. Not all, but some. Which is that they don't go after the right pests usually, or the really most destructive ones. And then, on top of that, they don't eat enough to be viable biocontrols. Both of which are traits that are um, like the first and second thing that you're looking at for biocontrols when you're researching a new one. I mean, sure, maybe it eats this, this pest, but does it eat enough of it to be economically viable for us to produce and also to, for the cultivators to use? That's why things like Persimilis and Cucumeris are so valuable because they are incredibly voracious. They don't really interact with other biocontrols in a negative way. And you can produce a bunch of them at a pretty good economic you know, amount. One that's gonna be sort of uh, not too much for other people to utilize. The main reason people use mantises and lady beetles in my opinion is because they're less informed about what they're going to do and they mostly just know that biocontrols are good but they don't necessarily know which ones they're going to be utilizing so that's my kind of opinion on that but it's a very good question Wonkpack asks best treatment for thrips like there's over 6,000 species of thrips a small segment of them very small percentage of them are actual pests for that matter kind of like the rest of mites we mentioned earlier but uh, in my opinion, I like to use, like if you have western flower thrips, for example, I'm a big proponent of predatory mites, like we mentioned earlier. Cucumeris and Swirskii are two of my favorites for western flower thrips, but thrips like uh, greenhouse thrips, which are like a little, a lot more bulkier and they're a darker color, um, those predatory mites aren't as effective against them. If you're doing chili thrips, some predatory uh, mites can be useful for them as well. But ideally, you want to use more than just one component of your IPM. You want to use multiple ones at once. Um, it's not very integrative if you're just using one thing. So another thing that you can use is like a knockdown application of like uh, botanical insecticides is something that is a compound or a product that is derived from a plant. So pyrethrin is one example of that. It's very common, very popular. But you have to be uh, careful with something like that because 
it's insecticidal or it'll, it'll affect a lot of other insects. Certainly, you can even have lethal and sublethal effects on some mites and as well, of course, that goes without saying some of your beneficials that might be mites or insects too. So you gotta be careful. That's why it's so common to use a knockdown first and then follow up with biocontrols. And another reason pyrethrin is great compared to a lot of other things is that it's got very low residual and it's photoreactive, which means that it decays quickly in the presence of light. Not all chemicals do this, of course, so that's one reason why somebody might want to use something like that. So that's just a, that's a quick example. If you want more, I have an extensive detailed answer to this question on my YouTube channel, Zenthanol, where I go after, uh, where I talk about Western flower thrips as a pest primer, and I also have a presentation if you're growing cannabis for uh, Western flower thrips and other thrips on the FCP02 channel. Easy710 asks, will BT, Bacillus thuringiensis, mosquito bits kill moths and larvae? Recently purchased soil came with passengers. Okay, well let me analyze this question a bit because if your soil came with moth larvae, that's sort of odd. If it came with fly larvae like fungus gnats or something, that's a little bit more understandable. So I'm not really sure what's going on with that. You know, caterpillars are generally if they are going to ever be in the soil, they're usually there because they're trying to pupate. They're usually rather large. So yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. Maybe you got beetle grub larvae. Maybe you got something else in your soil. I really don't know what the deal is with that. But with BT, Bacillus thuringiensis, the mosquito bits are not really meant to be applied like foliarly. You can apply them, I guess. They're mostly meant to be used in like a liquid medium, uh, the ones that I'm familiar with. So although it is BT, I would strongly recommend using a different kind of BT product potentially or a different product altogether since I'm not really sure if these are actually uh, caterpillars that you're dealing with in the soil. Uh, to be honest, that's my sort of intellectually honest answer to that question. King Koala 108 asks, can antimicrobial sprays like cinnamon oil harm microbial control agents like Bouveria bassiana? This is an excellent question because it, it kind of talks about something I've already mentioned, which is this sort of incompatibility compatibility scheme. I would say that yes, it could happen. I'm not sure if cinnamon oil in particular would be a negative um, effect on Bouveria, but a big, a big factor in this is exposure time the level of exposure, how much is actually being applied, and then also how you apply the Bouveria and how established it is. Because a lot of these products, you know, um, you can call a product antimicrobial, but what does that mean? Does it mean antifungal? Does it mean antibacterial? Or bacterial? Does it mean antiviral? Is it anti-oomycete? Nobody ever talks about the oomycota, the water molds. A lot of people talk about them like they're still fungi, but it's not, you know, the 1970s or whatever, and people know that they're two different uh, groups, even though they have very similar traits. The thing about it is that people are often worried, and for good reason, I definitely appreciate the concerns, better than being uh, sort of ambivalent, is if they apply something like pyrethrin or, another, or an essential oil or a um, sort of botanically derived compound that's meant to have this sort of negative effect on some microbes or some insects, will it negatively affect the microbes? Like if you apply wettable sulfur, if you apply too much or if you, you know, does some of it get into the soil and kill the microbes? Well, some maybe, but probably not the whole population if that makes sense because ostensibly, like with Bouveria, if you apply it into your soil, you're probably, if you've done it correctly, it should be inundated across the uh, cross-section. So in the top strata, the middle strata, the bottom strata, in the foliage, it should be all over the surface. So if you apply something like an oil or something like that, you know, and you get a few drops here and there or whatever, then you're probably not going to kill the whole population, right? But if that's not the case and you apply the Bouveria on the foliage and then right after you apply sulfur or a cinnamon oil or something, maybe you would have, I mean, with the sulfur you'll definitely have an attenuating effect on the mold, on the Bouveria, but you could also have a, a lethal or sublethal effect if it's too intense or too much coverage and uh, sort of too much at the same time. So yeah, I, my answer to that question is provisionally yes, but it really depends on the product. I'm not sure about cinnamon oil in particular.
AJ every day asks, how do you find a reliable beneficial insectary? I'm in New York if you want to give recommendations. My opinion on this is that in a lot of cases, the big name insectaries that most people know, they are pretty, they would probably find umbrage in the statement, but a lot of times they're pretty synonymous. Not to say that they're not special or they don't have you know, a reason why you might choose one or the other, because they do diversify, they do have different products but a lot of really good technical expertise and a lot of them, they're all going to be vulnerable to the same external forces like logistical issues, you know, one of them's not going to be unaffected while the other one is affected usually, unless it's something internal. Um, generally speaking, the prices are, in a lot of cases, they're pretty reasonable, pretty similar to each other. These are again primary insectaries where they produce the organisms in-house. Other ones are going to be less so. I don't really have a recommendation for your place in New York because a lot of the times people are going to be ordering them and they're going to be receiving them through the mail. So in that case, most people are not going there and picking up the biocontrols and then bringing them back locally. So I don't really have a lot of recommendations for that. I would say choose one that makes sense price-wise to you, makes sense if after you've talked to them that you'll be able to get them at a regular interval. If you're a commercial entity and not just like a home grower, for example, just a home grower, I'm not trying to demonetize anyone, but you know, if you're in a commercial setting, a lot of times the question is then a question of like, logistics and freight and how many that you expect to use over the span of a year at that point you're dealing with larger numbers uh, perhaps than most people are talking about here especially this question so yeah that's my kind of opinion Tricronic asks do you recommend essential oils like geraniol eucalyptus or tea tree oil as an antifungal the tea tree oil, um, there are some products out there that are good against certain fungi. I don't typically utilize them. I've had some people report to me that um, neem oil worked well for them against certain fungi, and indeed there are sort of generally antimicrobial compounds and then also some antifungal compounds and some neem products, although I would be remiss if I didn't also mention that there is a difference between like azadiractin, which is one compound of many in the neem, from the neem tree, and then also neem oil, which tends to have a bunch of stuff in it, various compounds, similar compounds, different ones. Fortunately, what happens is that the neem trees themselves will get applied uh, a pesticide, like a systemic pesticide, and then when they produce the neem oil, they do it in such a way where they don't actually worry about this and so sometimes in the past some people have gotten neem products where the neem oil had really noxious compounds pesticides in them and they didn't know of course they're not going to check because why you know why would you why would you expect to do that with what you know processes but uh, they apply it and then there's a bunch of negative effects to their plants or their insects or their biocontrols that uh, would not be explained by simple neem oil, which can also be negatively effective for your biocontrols to some degree. Uh, but for geraniol and eucalyptus, not as much. Uh, tea tree oil, I have more familiarity in that antifungal space. Oh, EZ710 asks about the maggots. Uh, they look like maggots in my bin. I store my dirt. I see grayish moths flying around. I wonder if those are, I wonder if those are meal moths or similar sorts of moths that are really common in um, residential places. They might eat your grain, they might eat your, your flour, your cereal goods and uh, things like that. Those are pretty common. And if they're in your, if they're in the bin that you store your dirt, it's possible that they're feeding on, there's a bunch of moths that will actually feed on um, uh, decaying plant matter as well and some of them are quite primitive. The very most earliest moths actually kind of survived in this manner and they didn't have the proboscis. They actually had, they still had the like chewing mouth parts and they still exist. So I wonder if that's what you're dealing with there. Trevor Payne asks, uh, thoughts on crop covers, companion plants, are they vectors? Specific examples greatly appreciated. They can be. They certainly can be. There's a lot of people who talk about uh, cover crops and companion plants and they like to make a big distinction between one or the other. Like a lot of aspects of IPM, you really have to consider what your what your goal and objective is to using them. If you're applying them because you heard on a podcast that cover crops are great and they do XYZ, you know, that's cool and all. That's 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 certainly how you learn. But 
you know, you have to make sure that what somebody else suggested is going to be relevant for your cultivation space. Clover mites are a type of spider mite. They don't produce any webbing, however, but they are in the spider mite family. They're not a huge pest. They're pretty low on the totem pole of importance, but spider mites, uh, these spider mites can still cause some damage, and uh, in a lot of cases, these clover mites tend to be on clover. Bryobia pradiosa, one of a few species known as a clover mite, is an agricultural pest of many grasses, including agriculturally important crop species. They have also been recorded on both coniferous and deciduous trees, like cedar and apple, low-growing herbaceous plants like iris and strawberry, as well as gooseberry, onion, and walnut. Despite being a spider mite in the family Tetranicidae, it does not produce silk, and its larger size of about 0.7 millimeters in length distinguishes it from other spider mites. Uh, those mites will then sort of go from those that clover, and they'll establish there, and then they'll go up into your. And I've seen them on cannabis and many other plants for that matter. You know, that's one example of a vector. Can they also be a vector for other pests? Absolutely. Most of the pests that cannabis deals with that are insects that people commonly deal with, like spider mites, thrips, uh, white fly, like silver leaf white fly, pretty good example. Those are all generalists. They all go after like hundreds of plants and they could definitely go after some of your companion plants and then go into your uh, crop plants. So you should be crop scouting those if you're using them and you should be treating them like you're treating your plants as well. Alternatively, you could use banker plants. I have a video on my YouTube channel that goes over uh, the use of pepper banker plants with the, and this is something that I did also as a trial. This is inspired by the research in the, in the video where me and the Cannabis Horticultural Association with Russell Pace. Russell deserves a ton of credit for propagating a bunch of the peppers from that research report, The Exploding Ember. They were able to find 12, I want to say about 1,200 predatory mites on one plant of these exploding ember plants, and they were really effective as banker plants for, uh, I think it was Swirsky and Cucumerus that we tried out. They're very effective because they can, the predatory mites can eat the pollen on the flower. Don't worry, they won't, keep, they won't eat all of the pollen. But they eat some of the pollen, and the flowers, they last longer as flowers because they're ornamental peppers and they have more flowers than other peppers because they're ornamental peppers. So it makes them a really great baker plant. So that's another example of something you could use. And I, you know, potentially those can get pests too, but you could perhaps put them, you know, they could, you could move them. So maybe you, um, you keep them in one place and you treat them separately. And then when you apply your biocontrols, maybe you move them in and you apply your bio, your predatory mites to the banker plant and to the crop plant. And then you can kind of give them like a, a garrison, sort of a base that they can spread out from. Trike Gnome asks, what would be the top three beneficials you'd introduce to a living soil grow? I will not introduce anything without knowing the context usually, but if I had to give like a contextless answer, I think that the most broadly applicable ones are Bouveria bassiana, uh, which you want to responsibly apply, not only because it tends to be somewhat expensive, but also because, um, you know, just I think it's really important that people don't just over apply anything. Just because it's natural or it's a biological organism doesn't mean that you can't get invasive species or you know whatever else. So Bouveria bastiana is low on the level of threat but it's still just something you should get into the habit of. But I like to apply it because it's very broad spectrum. It colonizes all kinds of insects and it will also colonize their cadavers too if they're already dead. So, and in some cases, it can be an endophyte. It can enter into the plant, and it can live in the plant. It can modulate the immune system, sometimes, usually, for the, for the benefit of the plant. Fascinatingly, insects will chew on plant tissue sometimes, and the Bouveria will get into the gut and will kill the, the insect. And in other cases, I've read leaf miners, they will somehow, it seems like they're able to detect the presence of the Bouveria, somehow because they will have, in the research they avoided plants that had col been colonized endophytically with Bavaria. Pretty cool. So that's one thing I like about that. The other two I would probably suggest are generalists as well. Cucumerus or Swirskii, take your pick. They are 
pretty synonymous, but there's some some differences between the two. Usually, I like to say Swirsky Eye because I have a lot of fondness, to be honest, with their success against a lot of different things. But Kakumris works as well, and is usually cheaper. It goes after things like, and usually the eggs and larvae of, well, not the eggs of Thrips, because oftentimes they put them in the plant. But Thrips, White Fly, a little bit of Spider Mite, but they're not really a, a counter. I would rely on them for Spider Mite control. Sometimes they'll even eat moth eggs too, a little bit, but again, that's sort of, um, that's not their main sort of trait. Uh, but they also go after Russet Mites, for example, Broad Mites, for example. So yeah, so they're pretty broad spectrum, and you can feed them on pollen by, by itself with no prey, and they can sustain themselves, and they're very, very reproductive on just pollen. Because the females, they don't have to waste a lot of energy trying to get a bunch of protein and, and other nutrients. They can just eat the pollen and reproduce um, voraciously. So, so that's, that, that's two. Um, I think the third one that I would apply, let's see, maybe another um, sort of bacillus product, maybe bacillus thuringiensis for that matter as well, uh, for its effect against um, a certain fly and also caterpillar uh, larvae, larvae as well. Troy Chronic asks a, a very helpful question. They ask, they say, you are so helpful and informative to the cannabis community. Well, I very much appreciate that sentiment. How can we best support you? And that's very, um, very appropriate here at the end of the, the stream. So there are a few ways that you can. First of all, my plan for this platform, for this live stream, is that I'll be doing it hopefully every week. It's meant to be a forum where people can ask questions and also you know, get really good answers and uh, learn a little bit about IPM and also other aspects of plant health. So you can support this by either joining on my Patreon for as little as $1 a month. You will get access to my Discord channel where about 130 or so people are also interested in IPM, help each other, and I also answer questions there. Uh, Instagram is um, it's great for a lot of things, but messaging is not one of them, and uh, I'm the kind of person who likes to answer as many questions as I can there, but it just becomes a little bit too difficult because there's so many people and so little time. So I'd very much appreciate if people would go to the Discord channel and ask their questions there. It's a lot easier to do that sort of a thing. Another way you can support me is through contacting me if you need help in a consulting capacity. That is my professional work after all, and it's very important to me to help as many people as possible. So I have uh, one hour consult calls, um, I also have other more involved sort of um, ways of helping people. So you can check me out at xenthanone.com for that information and inquiry, and then on top of that for other support. You know, just share my content, ask thoughtful questions. I had a lot of good questions here in the in the chat. I probably didn't get all of them, and I always feel bad when I don't. But you know, keep those questions for next time, or uh, ask those comments, um, ask those questions and comments in the uh, video comments here when I publish, and I will come back and answer those questions too. And I very much appreciate the sentiment. I very much appreciate the support. Um, yeah, and so just watch my content, share with people who you think it will be useful for, and hopefully that will uh, sort of ripple across the cannabis space and also the general agricultural space, and we can all sort of support each other with good information from empirical sources, and I think I will leave with that sentiment. Thank you very much for all of your great questions. I hope that it was valuable to you, and I look forward to hearing what you guys want me to talk about for next week. So support me in that way as well by engaging with the voting on my YouTube channel and also here on Instagram when I post the questions. Thanks a lot. Have a great day.